Ground. My name is Aaron Canole, and today we have another uh, few first-time players of the game. Uh, no long introductions, we're just going to get right into it. The first fighter we have is Zach Ford. Zach, how are you doing tonight? Oh, doing good. I'm ready to introduce myself to this league. I'm excited. Definitely, definitely. And our other fighter, Jeremy Adams, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great, so glad to be here. Uh People tell me I could talk for hours about movies, so I, I think I'll fit right in here. Uh, don't worry. We're not going to marathon this. You don't have to talk for hours. <laughs> Just a hour. Okay. I could, though. <laughs> I mean, I can leave the camera running if you'd like, but... Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll walk away, but you can just keep going. Okay, I'll just keep yammering. That's usually how it goes. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started with it. And the first question is a big one because news dropped this week that uh, director Colin Trevorrow, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, Colin Trevorrow had left episode, Star Wars Episode Nine, or from, from what I've heard, it, it seems more now like he was booted off the project, but we're not here to talk semantics. Uh, he is no longer directing, and so I thought it was only fit to ask. Uh, definitely an interesting question to give these guys right off the bat. Who should replace Colin Trevorrow as the director of Star Wars Episode Nine? And both these guys have gone, have submitted their picks. And one, uh, obviously a great choice, but a very conventional pick. And the other, again, another great choice, but not one I think a lot of people are putting the name out there. Let's see which one has the more compelling argument. Uh, Zach, you're going to go ahead and go first on this one. Just go ahead and give me your opening statements. Um, so mine, I'm assuming, is a conventional pick, although I wasn't up-to-date enough, so I didn't know he was a conventional pick at the moment. So um, mine is Ryan Johnson. It just makes sense to stick with something good. I know we have not seen um, his Star Wars yet, but from everything we see with the trailer, the fact that the studio seems to be on his side, he's already working really well with the studio, which is something that um, directors they've tried, like Lord and Miller or Josh Trank and maybe Trevorrow. We don't know what we're on, but they, they give these guys these shots and they haven't worked out. So why not would stick with someone that you know is delivering a product that you can support and someone who is um, – Supportive with the fans, someone who is a great promoter for the franchise. He is out at Comic Con. He shows that he is a super fan and really cares about what he is doing. Um, and it also just creates a consistency that I think should have been common sense in playing this trilogy at the beginning. You don't want three separate films, three separate stories. You want a continuing story. Um, they already changed it up once, but they can still kind of create some continuing. Um, by keeping um, Ryan Johnson on for two straight movies. Good. All right, that's fair points there. Jeremy, go ahead and give your opening statements. Well, I just have to start by disagreeing with your very premise that you don't want three different directors on a Star Wars, because how many directors did the original Star Wars trilogy have? <laughs> it had three directors, and I think it was awesome that they moved the story forward, but you got a little bit of a, a different film every time. And I think we have that here because we had J.J. Abrams set everything up. He passed it off to a great visionary director who came out of the independent world with Ryan Johnson. And now he's going to, you know, send it off, I believe, to someone else. And I think we should get someone else from the independent world, someone who has a real voice like Ryan Johnson does. And so I picked Alex Garland, who started his career as a screenwriter working with director Danny Boyle. He wrote 28 Days Later and Sunshine, which are two of my favorite movies. And then he also wrote Judge Dredd. So we can see that, that he, he knows uh, you know, sci-fi and genre material. And then he had his directorial debut with Ex Machina, with, which just happens to have two Star Wars actors in it, Oscar Isaac and Donald Gleason. So in my mind, he's kind of already got some one foot in this world. And I think he's a true original. He, he's a unique voice. And I think... He is the kind of uh, upcoming director that can really slide in there and, and take this trilogy to an end, picking up from the two great directors that came before him. All right, guys, great opening statements. You guys both clearly have an argument you're going in on, so it'll be interesting to see how this pans out. We're going to go ahead and give you guys five minutes to argue this one out before we move on to our closing statements. And I'll start the timer when one of you guys starts. All right, so... Um... 
going with the point that there's three separate directors for the original trilogy, you can say they are three separate directors, but basically they're outside George Lucas, they were placeholders. The director was George Lucas and Lawrence Kasdan having really directing where that story was going. These other directors were names they had on, and that's why they didn't make much of themselves outside of the Star Wars trilogy. Um, they're, this group, Kennedy and everyone, is trying to make sure that they're bringing in directors that have an artistic vision that, of course, will work with the studio, but the studio doesn't want to boss the story around. Kathy is not control, completely controlling where the story is going now. Um, they want someone that has a voice, and Ryan Johnson is becoming part of this, and he seems like he's already part of the family and someone that is right in there with it. And with Garland, he's another unproven director. He has one movie. He's a proven writer, not a proven director. He has one movie that is slight on scale, uh, not quite at Star Wars level, and we see what they've done with unproven directors. They failed on three straight. They were successful with, I would say Ryan Johnson was proof, but they were um, successful with Gareth Edwards. But they also had to bring in the help with that. So why bring in some another chance when you've already failed with three other directors? Because Garland would be another chance. Well, I would say, yes, they need directors that, that will have their own vision, but also work with them, like you said. And uh, Ryan, Ryan Johnson, I believe, has done that. And he, 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 I would say he was a proven director, but he wasn't a blockbuster director. He was somebody that had proven that Looper he has talent. Blockbuster. Yeah, he, he had proven Looper isn't blockbuster. Lo Looper was a medium budget movie and it made money, but it wasn't like on a Star Wars level. And I think he, he was somebody that could slide in there and follow their vision, but, but still he had a creative vision. He had a passion. And I think I don't see him as somebody that's going to want to be locked into one thing and keep making movies over and over. He, he's, he's, every movie he's made has been completely different. I believe that he wants to go on to the next thing now. He's fulfilled a dream and been part of a Star Wars movie, and I think he's ready to move on. And I believe that somebody like Alex Garland, he look at what he did with Ex Machina. It was a low-budget movie, but when you watch that movie, you're completely sold on that vision. You're locked in. You, you feel that it's all real, and the special effects that they used, they feel seamless. They don't feel like, I think, a lot of Star Wars movies, they get overblown, and the, the visual effects and the action sequences kind of take over. And I think with that little movie that Alex Garland made, he proved that it's all about the story, it's all about the characters, and the visual effects are in... in they serve that. And that little movie won Best Visual Effects, which is kind of amazing and which I completely agreed with. And I think he'll have that vision. Everything's going to serve the story. Everything's going to serve the characters. That's the kind of filmmaker, that's the kind of writer that he is. And he's always worked in a lot of genre, whether it be horror, science fiction, uh, comic books. And, but it's, he's always been about character. And that's what I think we need to bring this trilogy to a close. Yeah, I don't think he's he has character, but he's more cerebral in his direction and doesn't really quite have the heart and the emotion. And that I think through his screenwriting and through um, Ex Machina, Ex Machina is a good movie, but it's more um, it's, um, but it's, yeah, it's more cerebral rather than in having some sort of emotional heart, which we do want in our Star Wars. We want to see the growth of these characters that we really care for, and not quite um, always. We want the themes, but not quite just dwell in these bigger, um, more intellectual themes, which I believe Garland is the route he would take. I think that I would disagree and say that there definitely is heart in Garland's work, particularly if you look at a movie like Sunshine, where I, I was so moved by the Killing Murphy character and the plight that, that he had to, to go through to basically try to save the world. Like, you're so engaged with that character. And I would say the same thing about the Killing Murphy character in 28 Days Later. Like, these are characters that you, that you care about, that you can follow. And yes, he's cerebral, he's smart, he's intelligent, but I also think... He can bring the heart when it's needed. And I also, I also would say that Ryan Johnson was a cerebral f filmmaker. Like, you know, Brick and uh, Looper aren't exactly huge emotional movies. They have their emotional moments. But I think it's got to be a blend of the intelligence and, and the character and the heart. I believe that Garland is at the point in his career where he can step up and he can do that. And he's going to be a different voice. And I think we need different voices. I don't want everything to be homogenized. I don't want it to just become the Ryan Johnson series now. I think that it's been great that they've been, every movie's been taken a different direct in, uh, direction, and that includes the standalones and the, the uh, episodes. I, I want to see that continue. 
I don't think it's going to be homogenized. Before you guys get into that, I'm going to stop you there. That would be the end of the fight. So this is going to be your guys' final statements here. Uh, Zach, you were going to get to go first on this one. Final statements. Go ahead, man. Um, so my final statements to restate, um, we have something good. My worry is not whether Alex Garland is going to make a bad movie, but whether he's ever even going to make the movie. We don't know when they bring him in if this is going to go through because we've already seen new directors come in and fail. So I want to stick with someone that we know is they're going to work with us studio and complete the project, and there will be no delays and nothing we need to be concerned about. Um, and because we all would have thought Ryan Johnson is a perfect choice, so just keep just keep it working. Through. Done. And, and, Jeremy, <laughs> and I would basically say they've been trying to find new voices, and it hasn't always worked out. I think they got somebody with Colin Trevorrow who really doesn't have a voice. Like he doesn't, he doesn't really have a vision as at least in my opinion. And then, you know, you've got the guy, Lord Miller on the, on the uh, standalone Han Solo movie. These are guys that had a vision that clashed. And I believe that Alex Garland is a passionate filmmaker who will have a vision, but who will work with the studio. He worked with Danny Boyle for years, supporting Danny Boyle's vision. So we know he can be a team player. He can work on a team, yet he is a true creative, original filmmaker. And I think we need more of that. We need Disney to keep supporting that. We need them to not get uh, cowardly now and not want to have new voices. Because I was, I was worried about that with the Lord Miller thing. So I'm hoping that they'll get someone like Garland in there. They'll keep pushing forward and not just start resting on their loyals and laurels and getting cowardly. All right, great first fight, guys. Um, so just a couple things that I, I did pull up. Um, uh, Jeremy, you, you did run through Alex Garland's uh, filmography pretty well. Uh, his writing credit for 28 Days Later, Sunshine, uh, Never Let Me Go, I believe is the only one you didn't mention. Oh. That's more of an indie film. Yeah, I, I should meant. have mentioned it. I, I love that film. Forgot to mention that one. I want to talk about one with heart. That's the one you could have went to. Yeah, I yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then, uh, Dred, obviously, Dread Ex Machina, and then uh, next year he has another film called Annihilation, which he wrote and directed coming out. And then the other quick thing was uh, Looper, uh, with the, on the discussion of whether or not it would count as a big or low-budget movie. Uh, the movie itself only cost $30 million, so what, mm -hmm. while it may have a bigger sci-fi feel to it, I, it would actually count more as a mid-range, low-budget film. It wouldn't count as a blockbuster. Yes. Um, okay, so really, really good first fight from both of you guys. Um, there was a really great back and forth. Zach, your big points you brought up were the fact that Ryan Johnson has proven he can work with Lucasfilm. Uh, he obviously cares about Star Wars, specifically Star Wars, not just genre, and he it would keep the tone consistent. Uh, Jeremy with Alex Garland, um, you talked about how he brings the same kind of indie feel that Johnson can bring to it. Uh, obviously, we've seen, especially with Ex Machina, he works well with special effects as a director, uh, he consistently works with genre f uh, films, and that obviously Garland being more of an indie style like Ryan Johnson could be the different type of direction that could actually work with Lucasfilm, uh, as we have seen. They, you know, obviously we're not on set, we don't have the specifics of everything, but they do seem to have an issue of working with whatever directors they are choosing, which, which to me, at least my personal opinion, is an issue on the producer side and Kennedy side, because these seem like issues you should be catching at the start, not when you're that late in the production. But that's a whole other argument. Um, with hitbacks against it, the big hitbacks that were put up against Ryan Johnson were um, that filmography-wise, he doesn't seem to repeat himself too often. And then obviously there was the point made that uh, Alex Garland is very cerebral and you fought back saying that Ryan Johnson also makes very cerebral films. And I, I think that's a point that both of them ha are that type of filmmaker. They kind of come from the same cloth. Uh, they're both definitely more indie-oriented orient than they would be blockbuster. Um, and then uh, with Alex Garland, obviously there is the lack of experience. He only has uh, two films under his belt, but there was the one release that you can actually discuss with Ex Machina. Um, and then there was that you know he may not necessarily always bring the heart and emotion with his movies and then you obviously said 28 days later in sunshine um you fought back with that one so the, obviously there's a lot of good points that were thrown out in here close i'm glad we made it tough for you I shouldn't yes. be able to hear I shouldn't be able to hear a seven minute argument and go, oh yeah, Jeremy wins it. No, no, no doubt. <laughs> oh yes. That, that, exactly. that'd be bad. Oh. Mm -hmm. <sighs> um Shit. 
here's here's the thing, okay. The point that he doesn't bring emotion to his films, you could argue was was a good hit back against Alex Garland. And you definitely defended it well. Obviously, 28 late Days Later and Sunshine both have emotion within them. But then I, I would say probably his most emotional film was the one that you did miss. Yeah. But there was one big hit back I was looking for from Zach. And it's the fact that the question is about directing, and these are only writing credits. We don't actually know if mm -hmm. he's going to be writing the film or not. And, and again, we can make the assumption, because he writes his movies, but we don't know for sure what's happening with the script that uh, Trevor O and his uh, writing partner worked on. And so with that, the, the fact that he worked, you know, Ex Machina is a sci-fi film. He works well with special effects, and he would need that with Star Wars. I think I'm going to have to give it to Jeremy on this one. Ah, thank you. <laughs> but, but, but definitely, definitely a close fight. Um, it, it was a good fight both I, ways. There, there was a lot of back and forth. I did not expect to win that one. <laughs> <That's what laughs> <looking> you. <laughs> we're, we're looking for that back and forth. You yes. definitely want to bring that in the fight. Great, great point. I, mean, I, I want to see an Alex Garland Star Wars. We should make our arguments and then have like say our real opinions about what we're. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I, 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 oh, I, believe I, me, I I will I be doing that as we go on. <laughs> yeah. And I, my I, first, my first thought when you asked the question was Ryan Johnson. So, <laughs> but then I'm like, that's too easy. <laughs> yeah, I I think we can agree that both of them are good directors. If either one was yeah. announced as a director, I don't think anybody's coming out of that upset. No. Yeah. Um, all right, so then we're going to go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, so with the movie 9-11 coming out this weekend, which, yes, if people did not realize this, there is a 9-11 movie, and I believe it stars Nick Cage, if I'm not, if I'm not correct. I, will I, think it's Char I think it's Charlie Sheen. Or is it Charlie it's been, Sheen? It's yeah, it's been, sit it's been sitting on the shelf for like five years. <laughs> it's just it's now getting not, released. I, that, I was going to say, Nick Cage just sounds like the natural one. Yeah, Nick Cage him. was already in one. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. Nick Cage yeah. was. We're on Trade Center, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Let me see this. Mine 11. Yeah. Now, now I have to know. <laughs> yeah, it's Charlie Sheen. Uh, I remember them announcing they were filming it like five years ago, and then I never heard about it again until now. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what this movie is. I, I do know your question. Yeah. I remember them announcing Whoopi Goldberg and Charlie Sheen, and everyone was like, what? And then I didn't hear anything again, and then years went by. Yeah, that's just... That, that, Can you imagine that's a better cast of your tragedy movies? Oh, my God. Crazy. But anyway, so with that movie coming out this weekend, uh, I thought I'd ask a question that actually has some importance to it. Um, what is the best movie based on a tragic event? And with this one, Jeremy... Uh, you're going to go ahead and go first with opening statements. What is the best movie based on a tragic event? Well, it just so happens, wasn't intentional, I, I went with the 9-11 movie. <laughs> so I picked United 93 by director Paul Greengrass, which, you know, I, I mean, on one hand, I do feel like 9-11 is the tragic event of our, of our time. And it's something that, you know, I think we pretty much all live through. And so that that right there, you know, makes it, you know, kind of powerful just to, to think about, you know, having gone through that. But on the other hand, I think there are a few movies that take an event, take something that happened and put you there without any real melodrama, without any, you know, Hollywood schmaltz, anything put on top of it. They just put you into that event as cleanly as they can and this has been paul greengrass's style since he made a movie called bloody sunday which i almost picked which is a great film about uh an event that happened in 1972 in ireland where the police were beating up uh irish protesters um so he took that same approach which is kind of a documentary uh handheld man on the street approach he also used it in his action films and he took that to this uh, united 93 which is about the one plane that didn't hit its destination that actually crashed in a field and basically what he does is he films sorry sorry guys so he films the what's going people you know boarding the plane what's going on in the plane the plane lifts off and then of course terrorists you know come out and take over the plane 
At the same time, he cuts to the air traffic controllers on the ground. And the brilliant thing, what I really think makes this movie stand apart in a way that very few movies depicting real events do, is that he got the actual air traffic controllers to play themselves. So every second you're with these controllers, you're basically, they're not acting. They're just basically reenacting what they did on that day. And then you're cutting back and you're seeing actors acting out this event that takes place on this plane. And it just creates that intercutting creates such a reality as do, does the handheld documentary style filmmaking. And there are some actors in there you might kind of recognize. There's an actor named Christian Clemenson who's been in a lot of stuff. But they're not like, you know, it's not Brad Pitt. It's not Charlie Sheen. You know, these are just actors and you just completely buy in that you're seeing this thing happen. And it is truly one of the most heroic things that you can ever see because it's about, it's the one plane where the passengers stood up and they stopped the plane from reaching its destination. They, they stood up against the terrorists on that plane. They did something heroic that I think we all wish we could be capable of doing. And there's no sentimentality. It's just telling you and showing you how it, how it happened and it's powerful in a way that few movies are for me all right good opening statements zachary why don't you go ahead and go man so um what i do not want in my mo tragic movies my movies about real life tragedies is for them to be in the moment and ha make it feel like you're in the moment and be that realistic because it is unsettling and also c kind of exploitative we're using um, we're recreating accurately what happened in these lives for entertainment. And it's saying these horrible moments he's went through for entertainment. So I like mine to be a little more dramatized and not quite recreated. One that I think does great at that, um, at really creating a humanity in these characters and having us feel the drama of them, but not really being in their tr most tragic parts is Life is Beautiful. We have a full, like, hour to begin just to know um, Roberto Benigni's character and fall for him and really see him as a human so that when he gets put into the Holocaust, we can feel the, the tragedy that is going to this individual. We can, rather than just thinking of it as a group of people, it's harder to relate to that. But when you really get to know this character and feel for it, then you feel it. And not only that, but then you see everything else that might be going through his mind because he is still a parent. He is still a husband. You see him trying to save the innocence of his child. Um, kind of a viewpoint we haven't really thought of in the tragic moment of these people trying to do their family duties. Um, I know some people have called this exploitative as well because it treats it as comedy, but it's not a comedy. He's being comedic to save the innocence of his kid. He's making it seem like a game, just in case with the hope that they're going to come out, that he's going to still be able to, to have some of that innocence and not be completely traumatized. Um, so just having that as your focal point of the movie it is creating that more, um, it is sentimental, but a more relatable touch rather than feeling like you are in the plane. Um, without really knowing the characters that are on the plane as well, but kind of going through the same, like really unsettling moment that should not be something that we are being entertained by. All right, and with that, we're gonna go ahead and start the fight. Uh, five minutes on the clock when you guys start going at it. All right, well, I just have to say we have very different ideas about what is exploitive because for me, taking a documentary approach and putting on the screen these these real life heroes and what they did. And by real life heroes, I don't just mean the people on the plane. I mean the air traffic controllers as well. And every, how they had to do their job that day, how they had to not give in to the emotions and, and perform in a situation that I don't think anyone could even like comprehend. And they perform their jobs to the best that they could. And we see them, we see them reenact it. And then you go to the plane and you see these everyday people have to stand up and make these choices that are unfathomable and and watching that and relating to that to me is not exploitive that's by stripping away all the sentimentality by just making it like you're in the moment that makes it not exploitive that makes it real that makes it human that makes you connect to these things and for me life is beautiful like that isn't even like like, this is like a guy's idea of what the Holocaust was. It's a guy's idea of what a concentration camp is. It's not a real concentration camp. It's him create. He's like, 
oh, let's make a movie that deals with the Holocaust and let's just come up with the concentration camp and let's just tell a little fantasy story and, and get everyone's emotions at the end. Like, to me, that's I way more that's exploitive. Still into the theme. Still into the themes of the movie, it doesn't seem like a real concentration camp because he was doing his best to keep this kid out of that mindset that this is a, a concentration camp. So that's the stylistic approach. So you can like be, feel like you're in the game with this child coming at this tragic event in the mind of an innocent. Um, it is exploitative to have a documentary approach, but it is a, it's a thriller. It's a suspense movie. You're supposed to feel like you're on edge. For me to have an emotional attachment to these characters, I need to know the characters. I need to feel that they are humans, not a procedural approach where you're just going at it, you're watching them do their jobs. But I don't, I don't, I feel that this is an event that happened, but I don't feel the touch of the humans that were affected by that event. And this, I can see in a very intimate focal point of it, how these humans are affected, how these children are affected, um, and how they're trying just to maintain their humanity throughout this tragedy. And that's what speaks to more to myself. Okay, well, it's, it's not a real concentration camp. It's not a real situation it's a fantasy story it's it's a fantasy story that's designed to make you cry at the end about this boy that loses his dad it's it's all created it's all like concocted and it's so like calculated united 93 is not calculated united 93 is let's put you in that situation i wouldn't even call it a thriller i would say Let's go step by step and show what happened and show what real heroism looks like. Because real heroism isn't something that somebody writes to try to get an emotional response out of the audience. Real heroism is just people doing their jobs and making choices. And I don't need to see it 30 minutes of the, the guy on the plane, you know, and his family and his wife. I just need to see that guy doing something in that moment. And that's, that's human. That's real. If I want to see the step-by-step -step of what happened, if I want to find out about this, I want to see it in a documentary form. Or I want to read it in an article. I don't want us to be reenacting it like it's some sort of show, some play we are putting on of these people's lives who are deeply affected by this moment. I am interested in the families and the characters around this, but you don't need to have it in such a realistic approach with the hand cam and everything. First of all, also the hand cam. Go ahead. You're deep throughout the whole thing. That adds to the frustration. There, there is no, there is no documentary. There was nobody on that plane. We can't see. We don't know exactly what happened. We have some anecdotal evidence, but he takes all the evidence that he has and he recreates it as best that he can. And we know basically what happened, and he's able to walk us through that. And I think showing the air traffic controllers as a cutaway grounds it. it you're seeing them doing everything that they can you're seeing the people on the plane do everything that they can it's a counterpoint and that it it creates the drama it creates the tension it creates the reality of the situation and it's not it, it's not a doc you can never get this in a documentary yet it, it may it's more real than a documentary because it puts you into a situation that you could never really be in it's it's using the art of cinema to create something that couldn't be it's it's like documentary on another level but when you're doing that, you're, there's going to be things that aren't accurate. So you're, you, you're treating these people's um, lives kind of artificially, automatically. At least with, a, with an actual documentary, of course you can't be on the plane. I also don't want to see that. But you can interview the people that were part of it, and they can tell their story. I know the people were um, – some of them were in the movies with the um, – I am the nav, with the flight – people i'm blanking out i'm getting too <laughs> the air traffic controllers <laughs> thank you air traffic controllers we're in the movie but they weren't telling their story the screenplay writer was still telling this story as his version of how he interpreted it but i want to hear it from their point of views and not reenacted by people that that are just retelling something they weren't part of all right and with that that's going to be time on the fight okay. so the next st two statements you guys make are going to be your final statements of the fight jeremy you are first go ahead man that Paul Greengrass uses all of his ability as a director to put you into this situation in a way that feels very real, very, you're very in the moment, and that makes you get wrapped up in what's happening in the momentum of the event, and it all is, it makes it more human. It, you feel, I feel connected to what's going on because they're in that situation, and they have to deal with that situation, and they're just ordinary people. And he uses every skill that he has as a filmmaker to make that real and to make it even if 
not all the details are real, even if they made stuff up. It it feels so real in the moment. And Life is Beautiful is a, is a nice fantasy movie with a nice little sentimental ending, but no has no like real connection to the tragic event that it's like kind of sort of depicting. Go ahead, Zach. Okay, so to me, Life is Beautiful is showing the humanity within tragedy. To have the humanity, you need to get to know the characters, which you get a whole long hour before he's actually in the tragic event, to really get into his character, understand him, and be in his mind, understand his motivations, rather than being a voyeur, which is just like watching the other people go into this, but you really are inside their heads and understanding their humanity, their emotions that they are feeling. Um, and Life is Beautiful also kind of takes that humanity and shows that how it is affected um, and how it is trying to be maintained within the tragic events. It's trying to be maintained for his child. He knows his is gone, his is lost, but his child still has some hope to come out of this without being completely um, destroyed. And that's really helping me relate to it and understand how will I be in a tragic event and how will I maintain my own humanity. Um, I don't need a step-by-step -step process of how this event is going to look like for me. All right, and with that, guys, that brings us to the end of round two. Once again, great fighting from both you guys. Um, <laughs> that might have been a more aggressive one. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah, of that, that got a little heated that time. I got, was yeah, getting, that, that, that my face exactly is getting that red. <laughs> uh, just, just a little bit of cleanup on that one. Um, obviously, I think we can agree that both of these are good films. Uh, if we're just going to look at how much how many people like them, uh, United 93 has a 91% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Life is Beautiful has an 80% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, and then the other thing... Is, no one it up. The other thing is you guys... It won, it won a bunch of Oscars, though. Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> um, also, I didn't bring that. The other thing you brought up was the fact that most of the cast is unknown. Um, and the only one out of them who seemed to have any major projects was the one you named Christian Clemenson. Yeah, uh, he seems to be just a background player in most of the stuff he's been in. But the, the, the three big things that stand out beside this movie are he was in Apollo 13 and The Big Lebowski, and he was also a part of American Crime Story, The People vs. O.J. Simpson. Yeah. And the main terrorist was in The Kite Runner and a lot of other films. Very recognizable actor as well. All right. So with that, um, once again, great arguments back and forth, guys. But in the end, it comes down to, because I think well, both hits you guys had against each other's films, you, you fought back against them pretty well. Um, in the end, it comes down to, basically, your main argument was, one is a more realistic, gritty approach to showing the event, and that's how I connect with it. And the other was, this is, yes, it's a little more, it's not as realistic, and it's not as based in reality necessarily. Obviously, the Holocaust is the Holocaust. You, know, you can't ignore that. But um, it's a little more uh, family-oriented. Not family-oriented. It's a little more character-driven, and it's, it's more focused on the people in the event and not the event itself. And that's why I connect to it. And I think, to me at least, I think Zach did a better job at selling me on the connection and why that makes it easier to connect with and enjoy. I can't say, you know, we, we can't enjoy 9-11 and the Holocaust, realistically speaking. Hmm. Um, but I think he did a better job at arguing on the family connection parts. So I'm going to go ahead and give the point to him. Great, great job, Zach. See, that's when I thought <laughs> I had no chance. Really? That's when I didn't even... <laughs> actually, no. I've never seen United 93, and ah. it's not because I don't watch. I do want to see it. <laughs> I have and it from life. And I, lo and I love Life is Beautiful, so... <laughs> oh, good. A lot of people don't. That's why I, I thought it would happen. I know. It had a backlash, but it's a wonderful movie, so great job. Thank you. That was, a, that was a great job from both you guys. Uh, so with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to the third round. Uh, again, two very different choices we have here for <laughs> you guys. To say uh, the least. The question <laughs> is, what is the best child actor performance and uh, Zach, you're going to go ahead and start with opening statements on this one. What is the best child actor performance? All right, so my best child um, actor performance is a Oscar-winning performance. It's Ma Margaret O'Brien, who played Tootie and Meet Me in St. Louis. Um, she there is a pure child. She has this innocence and this charm, but also this um, really relatable sadness that comes with being a child. And that's what I really appreciate in a child acting performance that you don't see that often. Usually your children's performances are precocious or some sort of mysterious, but you don't see a kid really 
living and being a kid. And in this movie, you see um, the family go throughout a year and going through different holidays and experiences and going through a move that to a child is tragic to. to um, I don't know how old she was in the movie, but she was eight at least when she won the Oscar for it. So maybe eight when she filmed it. Um, but for an eight-year-old, having that move is terrible. And you see, even though she's this charming little girl and full of joy, making jokes and sometimes dark jokes, which happens in kids, um, talking about a they made a dress look like a dead body and they put it on the train tracks. So everyone thought that this body was being run over and the funniest thing and an eight-year-old would do it. And she sells that with just joy. But then you see her get into the more dramatic, the sad moments of just after being sung to by um, Judy Judy Garland, she goes and just starts smashing snowmen because she knows it's her last Christmas and that's just her cathartic release and it's just you're, you're reliving kind of what it was like to be a five-year-old and it's not stylized. It's very, for me, well, it's stylized in the way that 40s movies were, but it's not stylized in what it, it means to be a kid. She's is being pure child. I'm good there. All right, and Jeremy, go ahead and pitch your pick. Who is the best child actor? Well, for me, when I think of child performances that wow me, the thing that always astonishes me is when the, the child actor is actually the lead in the movie and basically carries the entire movie on their shoulders. And I think it's something that usually the child performance is kind of a supporting player. I thought of a lot of, a lot of other great ones, like The Professional with Natalie Portman. She's more of a supporting character. I mean, you know, big, but... There are a few times where the kid really carries the movie and really is the heart and the soul of the movie. And the one that totally comes to mind for that is Haley Joel Osment in The Sixth Sense. Now, there's so much that this 10-year-old actor did in this movie that I think most adult actors can pull off. For one, you know, what do we think about when we think of The Sixth Sense? We think of the twist. Well, who's the one character in the movie that knows that secret? It's him. And if you watch the movie, he knows that secret the entire movie. And the way that he plays that, it isn't just, oh, he's just a kid and the director's just telling him what to do. He is actively playing. He can't really, he doesn't want to let Bruce know what he knows. He doesn't want to, like, you know, give it away. He's trying to look out for the feelings of Bruce, you know, not to totally just give away the thing that everyone probably already knows. But <laughs> he... You know, he's playing that the whole time. At the same time, he's got the world on his shoulders. He's, he sees something that other people don't see. His mom's beginning to think that he's mentally ill. You know, yeah. Bruce it's is okay. there all the time. Go ahead. Okay to spoil it. Huh? It's okay to spoil it. Okay. Okay, so he knows, <laughs> he can see ghosts, and he knows that Bruce is a ghost, but he doesn't, he can't let what? Bruce know. He's trying, he's trying to protect these, these spirits. And because he cares about them and he knows that they're just people. So he's trying to protect, you know, them. And he's just all of the weight in that movie is on this kid. And, and it's just an amazing what he has to hold in, what he has to let out at certain points when he finally let, tells his mom at the end, when he finally opens up to Bruce. And this is the sensitivity that he plays that scene where he finally kind of gives it away to Bruce. It, it's amazing for a young actor, for any actor to pull of that, all of that off. And that entire movie sits on that performance. All right, great opening statement, guys. We're going to go ahead five minutes on the clock when you guys start speaking. Okay, so are we good? Okay. Um, now, now I lost my place. That's okay. <laughs> so we talked about Haley Joe Osmond as really putting that movie on his shoulders. Um, but I think it's more impressive when you steal the movie but when it's supposed to be on someone else's shoulders. And I think that's what Margaret O'Brien does from an icon of Judy Garland. And I don't think Haley Joel Osment completely steals him from Bruce Willis. I still feel very attached to his story, and that twist works because we are seeing it from Bruce Willis's eye. So his performance, I think, is equal to Haley Joel Osment's. But Margaret O'Brien, in, in song scenes, Judy Garland's like prime thing, in dance scenes, Margaret O'Brien is the one I am watching, I am stolen. They do a fun song scene um, under the bamboo tree where – it's supposed to be just something they're performing for their families and their guests. And it looks like an eight year old performing for guests. She kind of has this like forced smile that she's trying to do her best that she loses sometimes as she like thinks about her moves. And it's 
like when I see my cousins or when I perform as kids that I watch her videos and she messes up sometimes. You know they rehearsed this many times, but they still had it in and she had it in her performance to make it seem like a realistic kid performing in front of her families. Make some jokes with Julie Garland correcting her. And she she is the humor and the thing of that song, even though Julie Garland is singing. And then the second song, classic, Wish You a Little Merry Christmas, like Julie Garland sings it wonderfully, but what I'm watching is Margaret Bryan just watching her, just listening, because it's that face is so intent, and you can see her face kind of getting that emotion and getting sadder and really living that song, which leads up to when she starts destroying the snowman and that cathartic, and watching her listen is what earns that moment later when she is destroying the snowman. Well, I, I still, you know, when watching the scenes uh, from that movie, I still see a lot of the artifice, which is just, you know, that was just the style of filmmaking at that time, and I think just the, the way that the child actors spoke it was kind of uniform they had a way of speaking that was it was like oh they're they're speaking up to the other characters and they're just really an artifice to it and though i mean i'm talking not taking anything away from the performance i mean obviously she she was she it was a breakthrough role but it just it's still kind of for me kind of blends in with a lot of the the performances of that time they all had kind of a uniform thing to them and though she has you know, some standout moments. I still think it's just another kind of child performance from an earlier era that was done in kind of a mannered style. Whereas what Haley Joel Osment did in The Sixth Sense is, I mean, there's not much like it. He, yes, Bruce is great in that movie. Bruce has his great scenes, but Bruce is basically in denial the entire movie. And the real story is about this kid. And now he has to, you know, deal with what he, with the gift that he has. And now he has to deal with, his mom and trying to connect with her and then with Bruce and trying to connect with him and trying to bring these two worlds together in a certain way. The entire movie is about what is this kid going to do? How is he going to crack the scene where he gets locked in the dark attic and he's screaming is terrifying. And it's like, how is this kid even going to get through this movie? It's, it's insane. And the grace and the, and the humanity and everything that he has in his performance and every scene in that movie like it's it's not mannered, it's not artificial in any way. It feels totally real yeah, as you watch it. And every viewing, you get more out of it because you know this kid knows stuff and he's holding back because you've already watched it. It, it only gets better. You said it yourself that the story is with the character. That's why we give more attention to Hayley Jawson's performance than it deserves because it's the story that is what we saw nothing like. Not necessarily the performance. You have to get a chance because we haven't had a story like that. It's a screenplay that's creating this great character. But I think you could throw in any other child actors. I think the ones I'm about to list were a little over. Like Freddie Highmore, throw him Freddie Highmore. He would have done a great job. I think we've seen performance recently that were as good in that kind of dark, more broody, secret-holding way. Like in Midnight Special, um, it's Jaden Lieber Hoarder. Am I mispronouncing that? And the kid in Looper, to go back to Looper, also doing a great job of pulling the Stark Secret. We have seen that many times. But I can't think of a time where I see this just pure joy and innocence, but also can switch to that. Because I always draw and draw into movies that have this sadness of childhood, because it's so relatable that you can be um, really activated by certain events and how that is very internal to you, how you're internalizing that, and how it's going to affect her whole adulthood. You can feel that this movie, this attacking the snowman laying it out is affecting her whole growth. It is um, something I can relate to more than a, a wonderful like thriller, but it's something to more enjoy, not something I can really um, feel like they're putting in a character that is like someone I see every day. Cause that's hard to do is something realistic. All right, and with that, that's going to be okay. the end of the main fight. So you guys are each going to get one more chance to prove your arguments in the final statements. Zach, you're up first this time around. Go ahead, final statements. Yeah, and something I forgot to mention is that they um, had a special award at the time in the Oscars, the um, a youth Oscar for child actor, because they didn't um, quite feel it was necessary to do it at that point. And so they, they gave it out a few times, Shirley Temple being the first, but it was five years um, apart from the last time they gave that award and they gave it to Margaret O'Brien, who's eight years old. So they definitely saw that there's something that set it apart from other child performances of that time. The one five years before was Judy Garland, who was almost 18 with The Wizard of Oz. And she had to win it for two movies. She had another movie that had Babe in Arms, I believe is the name of it. And then before that was Mickey Rooney, who was 18. So to take that long to acknowledge a true child 
performance shows that they thought it was special and I still think it lasts today because I still feel like this is a child that could exist um, today and not necessarily just in the 40s. All right, and Jeremy, final statements going. Go ahead. Have to fire back on a couple things. One, there were a lot of extraordinary child performances in that era. You had Elizabeth Taylor in National Velvet. You had like something a little darker, The Bad Seed. I mean, within that that era, there were there were a lot of standout child performances, but they were all within that kind of mannered, you know, way that films were made at that time. They all had that artificiality to them. And I think the one that you picked is a standout, but it kind of for me it blends in with a lot of the child performances of that time. Now, I hate the argument that, oh, you could just slide in Freddie, Freddie Highmore or some other talented actor into that role. Well, you could say that about anything. Well, maybe you could have got John Voight to be in Raging Bull. He probably could have pulled that off. It's, that's a stupid argument. I don't, I, what we have is what we have, and what we have is extraordinary. And that movie works because of his performance. Yes, the script is good. The script definitely helps. But if he wasn't good, it wouldn't matter. Because we have to believe that he is dealing with all this stuff we have to see it in his face we have to feel it every moment and we have to be to to be with this character if this is just some kid that can't pull it off or just isn't even quite right like maybe freddie Heimer wouldn't have been quite right in the role if it isn't totally right the whole movie falls apart and it's extraordinary like for any actor it's extraordinary and for this actor this is this is a lead role this is a memorable role that that will stand forever that people are always going to remember and it's Haley Joel Osment and it's one of a kind all right and with that that was a great fight guys once again very passionate that that's what we look for is people who are passionate about the picks that they have uh just some quick cleanup on this one um uh, when in terms of when they were filming the movie uh from what I could find Margaret O'Brien was six years old when she filmed Meet Me in St. Louis Haley Joel Osment would have been around 10 years old when he filmed um, obviously, uh, Zach beat me to it, but uh, Margaret O'Brien was awarded the Academy Juvenile Award that year. Uh, Haley Joel Osment, however, for his performance, was also nominated for a Best Supporting Actor Award. Um, and just to clean up, because I know you asked about the pronunciation, the actor you were referring to was Jaden Lieberher, who has appeared yes. in films like St. Vincent, Midnight Special, Book of Henry, and the upcoming It. So he's actually already got quite the resume at a young age there. Um, okay. So, but, but and he's in it now, right? Good? He's the, the lead in It, right? Yeah, he's in okay, It, he's yes. The lead, he's the lead child in It. And he's also, unfortunately, in Book of Henry, right? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Colin Trevorrow. Speaking of Trevorrow. <laughs> we missed our chance on Jaden Lieberher in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right, guys. So, uh, with that, once again, great arguments from both you guys. Um... However, the, the, there was one point that really stood out to me, and it's the point that's why I'm going to give Jeremy the point, is the simple fact of Haley Joel Osment was playing a more complex character than uh, Margaret O'Brien was, and that was something that, that was a positive towards Zach's argument, was it is very simple and very childlike, which is not something you see in films often. But mm -hmm. I think the complexity of what Haley Joel Osment had to do in the role at such a young age is the, the big aid that Jeremy brought out in his argument, and it's why I'm going to give him the point uh, in this battle. That was an incredible argument, Zach. My hat's off. Yeah, is, this way yeah, I, would, I would take a second just to say, Jeremy, I do admire you. You're a good guy. Just since you're like shouting at the screen, I don't want it to seem so aggressive otherwise. Oh, I'm shouting at the screen? Yeah, no, we, we, we appreciate we're it. We're both guys. shouting at the screen. Who is? <laughs> We both are. Oh, okay. Well, I'm no, sorry. It's, we, we it's not you. Yeah. It's the movies. It's the movies. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm pretty sure no one that's ever competed has anything personal against anyone in this league. Of course not. But no, no, definitely the, the passion is what we like. Um, and yeah. with that, uh, the score going into the fourth and final round of the main fight is going to be 2-1 with Jeremy just barely in the lead. And we're going into this final fight uh, before heading, and, and and that's the one thing is, with that, uh, with because it was one one, we we will have a speed round. There is no knockout today. Okay. Um, but going into the fourth question, uh, the question is best David Cronenberg movie, and I asked this question, and I put out the caveat, and this this is something, this is some inside game here. I put out the caveat in the chat of. 
if neither of these guys were big Cronenberg fans, because I know he can be a very niche director sometimes, I'll be happy to pull the question back and replace it with something different. Um, the reason I put the question out there is because uh, actually 10 years ago this week, Eastern Promises was released in theaters. I believe that's the name of the movie. Um, I hope I got that right. That'd be awful if I got it wrong. But, um, but both these guys immediately came back. Uh, but originally, they came back with the same answer. <laughs> and then because, because of a mishap on my end, uh, one of them changed it. Thank you. And the fact that he came up with another <laughs> solid pick so fast shows these guys clearly know what they're talking about. So let's go ahead and get to it. And Jeremy, you're going to be going first with your pick. What is the best David Cronenberg film? All right, well, just to give a little history, David Cronenberg was a filmmaker in Canada, and he made some really interesting low-budget films, mostly in the horror genre. Uh, one, of, one was a car movie, but uh, he had started to gain some notoriety. He made a, a, a couple, a few movies, The Brood, Scanners, and uh, I believe he had made Videodrome at this point, uh, where they were starting to get more mainstream Hollywood actors in them, and he was gaining notoriety. So, okay, now it's Cronenberg's chance to kind of step onto the main Hollywood scene. What is, what is he going to do? And at the time, Stephen King was a huge thing, and a lot of uh, new upcoming directors and, and Hollywood directors were, were trying to get all the Stephen King properties. So Cronenberg jumped onto one of King's books, The Dead Zone. And for me, this is, this is when you look at Cronenberg's career, like you look through all of it, this is like the ultimate Cronenberg movie for me because... Uh, some of his films are really idea-based. He's dealing with big ideas, especially the more recent movies. They're more cerebral. They're dealing with big concepts about life and death and, and morality and mortality and things like that. And other movies are more physical. They're about the flesh and, and they're, they're more like uh, horror-based films where the, the flesh is destroyed and disgusting things can happen and surreal things can happen. And that all is in the dead zone. It's a story about a man played brilliantly by Christopher Walken and what is just one of my favorite performances ever as a man named Johnny Smith who has a car accident is in a coma for five years wakes up his entire life he feels like is over the woman that he loved has moved on and he realizes he has a psychic gift now and it's just this really interesting story about how he becomes begins to realize he has this gift and he starts to use the gift and then it takes him into some pretty dark places there are some really memorable moments. There are some shocking moments, but it is a it's a movie of ideas, and it's a it's a character based movie in which you get involved in it. And I think it really embodies a lot of the best Stephen King elements, and it really embodies the best elements of David Cronenberg as a filmmaker. All right, and with that opening, we're going to go ahead and pass it off to Zach. Your opening statements. What is the best? Uh, I almost said Stephen King. What is the best David Cronenberg movie? Stephen King's on the mind. <laughs> so, um, Jeremy had it right that what we want from David Cronenberg is a combination of um, the physical, the gore, um, kind of the thrilling side of him, that grotesque side, um, but also the cerebral side. And I also, of course, as I've been saying, I want that emotional side as well. And I think what does that better than the dead zone has that cerebral side and even more the physical gory side um, is the fly. And the fly also was able to be a little more accessible. It wasn't really uh, stuck in complete thriller genre. It is a monster movie, but it still has some humor and some fun and some, some excitement to bring it to his style to a broader audience without taking away any of the Cronenberg style. He still had some of his themes that he likes to, to um, go into, kind of like the creepiness of some sexual sexuality that is through all his movies is in the fly. Um, the blanking out on other things I was going to say now. Um, kind of the, the paranoia when something suspenseful, something weird is happening. That is all there. The um, kind of the taboos and fears of society, that they have the fears of what science can do, of what it might turn you into, which it does. That is in that love, why they want to publish articles and um, why he's scared of how people are going to go about it is the fears of what, how people are going to react to something like this um, as well. And I just feel that Fly is able to, to take all that themes, 
all that Cronenberg stuff and, and make it fun and make it have this old feel to a classic movie. And it was a classic movie, which makes it more impressive because this is the one we talk to. You don't see many remakes that are the ones we talk about, especially a remake of a movie that was good. The original one is still a renowned one, but when you think of the best one, it is the remake, which makes it all more impressive. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and get into the fight, guys. Five minutes to argue it out. What is the best David Cronenberg movie? Cronenberg movie, The Dead Zone versus The Fly. Argue it out. Now, I would argue when I look over Cronenberg's entire career, from the beginning to the end, I don't actually think The Fly is, is the most Cronenberg-y movie. And the, the reason is, one, I talked about those big ideas. Uh, I think of some of his films like A History of Violence. This is a movie about a character who's lived his entire life being violent, and now he's got to start over and try to live a normal life, yet that violence is going to still come out, or is it inherent to him now? And then in, in The Dead Zone, there is a, a great, huge uh, concept that is introduced, basically, which is that Johnny, the character with the gift, sees something that he doesn't want to see. He sees an evil man. He sees something that's going to happen that is incredibly evil. Well, what is Johnny's responsibility now? And this isn't just a psychic, like something that psychics would have to deal with. Like This is for all of us. When we see evil in the world, what is our responsibility? Are we responsible to do something? Should we do something violent? Should we just stem back? Like These are huge ideas. What's the huge idea in The Fly? The huge idea in The Fly is... Science goes wrong and something bad happens and then the decay of the flesh. That movie is all about the decay, the clay, decay of the flesh. It's about watching somebody that you love die. And that, that's visceral and that makes for an interesting movie. But I think it's a, it's a lower concept. It's a lower idea. And I also would say that movie's very set bound. Like it's almost like a play. It's got three characters. Whereas most of Cronenberg's movies are very opened up. They're in big spaces. We see like real life. We see people in their homes. We see humanity. And then we see the little weird, odd, creepy things that happen behind the scenes. That to me is Cronenberg. And for me, The Fly, that's him trying to make kind of a studio movie. It's not as, mu it's not as much of an example of a great Cronenberg movie in that way. Um, but what we are arguing is not what is the Cronenbergiest movie. We're arguing what is the best Cronenberg movie. I don't want to watch the Cronenbergiest movies, that's when you get Cosmopolis. That's super Cronenbergy. It's horrible because he's just fully at his whims. I want him to have, still have his style, but still have some sort of accessible touch. He's balancing out his Cronenberginess with something that's going to have more appeal and more appeal to my taste and really classical appeal. It is a classic monster movie. And when you're talking about it, it has no substance and no themes. It has a very classic substance and a theme, and that is the risk of a science scientific venture. That is what we see in all monsters movies, and he still makes it really relevant. And he even touches them more because he teach, deals with it in an intellectual sense of the um, journalist, or yeah, the journalists and the other scientific magazines and the other people in his field and how they're going to react to this because they understand that the risk of science and is it worth it. And um, I think that is a more important theme to our time than anything that's done. Dead Zone. Dead Zone is a is slight and forgettable. And it is poppy, and that's why a lot of people kind of forget about it. It's not that they don't know about it. It made a decent amount of money. It didn't make that. It made, I think, $10 million less than The Fly. It was still a successful movie. Fly, I believe, was the most successful box office. But it was forgetful. The people that remember it remember it because of Walken, because they like Walken, because they like the performance, but not because of the story at all. It was, as a Stephen King novel, it was a slight poppy novel. Not anything that is going to be a little more in-depth and exciting and memorable because the plot isn't super exciting and it has the serial killer aspects and it has Martin Sheen as the politician who is corrupted that we see all the time and the fact that, that Martin Sheen is a politician no one thinks about Martin Sheen in that movie you name Martin Sheen movies you it rare to find someone that would say dead zone they might even said dead zone but forget Martin Sheen is in that movie <laughs> when you think of Jeff Goldblum you think of the fly Christopher Walken is probably like the 10th movie people would mention but Jeff Goldblum is the fly giving I think one of the best performances specifically with his eyes, especially that's what you mostly see as he undergoes the transformation and with that wonderful makeup job is you see his eyes and you see how they maintain still his identity and how they even get like bugger and crazier and his posture changes with how he changes. And I think that's a much more physical and still cerebral performance because you're seeing, you can tell how his mind is going, how it is changing, but just by looking at his eyes, it's a more cerebral and physical performance than Christopher Walken gives. 
Well, I, I would argue that it's a monster movie. Cronenberg was tasked to make a monster movie, and he used all of his skills as a filmmaker to make a monster movie. He had good actors in there, and he did what he could. But I think the best Cronenberg movie for me is a movie that it really ex expresses the director's passions. It, express, it, it expresses the character's full personality fully, not just a part of it, but all of it. And I... I don't know, maybe you forgot The Dead Zone, but I've never forgotten The Dead Zone. That movie is in my soul, as is the book, because it's this tragic story about this character that I care about. I mean, yeah, the Seth Brundle thing, yeah, you, you watch this guy fall apart, and it's, a, and it's entertaining, but I, I care about Johnny Smith, and the heart that Christopher Walken brings to that role is amazing. And, and it's just, we're seeing this town, we're seeing this whole environment, and he's able to kind of see things that other people don't see. And Cronenberg brings his, his visceral touches to the movie that, that make it, you know, yes, it's a, it's a movie with heart. It's a movie with ideas, but it also has these amazing physical moments. There's a moment where he sees a fire in a house and we see a fish tank, the water boiling. That's such a unique image that he brings. There's a suicide that takes place. You mentioned a serial killer plot that is something that well, I, will, I will never forget that moment. That moment is seared into my mind. And there's a scene where you see boys fall into the ice and they're drowning underneath the ice. He holds the shot. It's almost angelic, these bodies. It's all these little moments in, in what is a real uh, environment and that he... he he brings his, his, all of his talents as a filmmaker to, to create these weird, odd, strange, horrifying moments within something that feels more real, that feels more grounded. And you keep, when that climax comes, you care about the decisions that character is making, and, you, and you're wondering, would I make those same decisions? It's, it's very powerful, and I feel the director's vision in there, and that's why, to me, that's his best movie. That's Cronenberg's best, most passionate filmmaking. Okay, and with that, that is going to be, we went over time a little bit, that's going to be the end of the argument. Um, so what, what I'm going to do, Jeremy, you're going to go ahead and make your final statement. Mm -hmm. uh, Zach, what I'm going to do for you, just because Jeremy did go over the clock a little bit, I'll put, after he gives his, uh, if you want, I can do it before or after he gives his final statements. I can give you 30 more seconds to talk, and then we can do his final statements, or he can let him do his final statements. Do his final first. Okay, so do your final first. I'll make... I, I talked a lot. I'll, 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 is I'll run the 30-second clock. I'll tell him when it's ended, and then from there he can finish off his final statement. Okay. So go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, my, okay, so my final statement is uh, Cronenberg is, is a director that ha he, he is cerebral, but he can still, his movies get you involved in the characters. They have heart, and they're also visceral. And they take place in worlds that we can understand, like I said before. And and that is more fully expressed in The Dead Zone. It's more fully expressed in a movie like A History of Violence. The Fly, it's basically a play. It's a staged film play, basically, when you think about it. It's all on one set. It's set bound. It's artificial. And it's a monster movie with a lot of goo and effects. And for me, it doesn't. that's not the best Cronenberg movie because that's not the full expression of who he is as an artist. And I see all of that in The Dead Zone. I, I see a character that I relate to. I see huge ideas about what is right, what is moral. Um, what is, does he really have a psychic gift? Could he be, uh, maybe he, it's in his mind. Maybe it's some sort of psychosis. You don't know. I mean, uh, it, if you believe something, does it become true? There's so many ideas in that movie that you can revel in. And the Martin, Martin Sheen is great in that movie. He's, he's such a fantastic villain. And, and there are other great characters that come in. Tom Skerritt comes in just throughout that movie. And it, it, it just goes from one story to the next. And it's, it's just, it's very much a Cronenberg. Uh, it's all, everything that he has thrown out there. And it's also a great Stephen King story. It's, Stevie, it's what Stephen King really is at his heart, which is a story about characters and ideas more than horror. And the horror is there, but that's not really what it's about. And for me, it, it's at the top of Stephen King adaptations. And only Cronenberg could have done it the way that he did it. All right, good final statement by Jeremy. Zach, like I said, I'll start the 30-second timer. I'll tell you when it's over, and then from there you can continue your final statements. But you get at least the guaranteed 30-plus however long afterwards you want. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start it. 
Okay, so when you bring up the dead zone to someone, they're going to go, oh, I never heard of it. I'll go, oh, yeah, that's good. You bring up the fly to someone, they go, oh, yeah, that's that's so great because it is instilled in our culture. It is instilled in what we think of as horror movies, as sci-fi movies. It is considered classic. Dead zone is considered an underrated good movie, but not a classic. Okay, the fly is something we um, think of as one of the best modern horror monster movies. Okay, it equates to all the classic Universal monster right, 30 movies. Thirty seconds is over. Yeah, what the monsters movies did so great back then was they had the heart. You said that Dead Zone has more heart. I think there's so much more heart in the fly because when you have these monsters, you can still sympathize with them and understand where they went grotesque. You're sympathizing with that this baby um, slows to the fly. Um, these ba this baby is his last chance to save his humanity. Uh, it's the last little bit of him that is left before he's gone full fly. And you can you can see what's turning him into a monster. And, and sometimes you might even be rooting for the monster. And that is where what creates these heart is I can understand the human of this creature, the humanity of this creature, and not just seeing him as a a monster gone wrong and you bring up that um there's not a lot of space there. first of all expanding space is not something we think of as Cronenberg that's not a Cronenberg specialty it's having wide space so the fact that it's in um only a couple of rooms doesn't take away the Cronenberginess and the fact that he's able to keep it so contained but still make it very cinematic is it cannot be on the play because you don't get to feel that makeup and see that ooze and see that gore you get to um is i Having, I'm an English teacher that cannot have a vocabulary today. It's, it's more physical. You feel. On the play, it's, it will be distant. So, okay, so this is very important for it to be on the screen. And so that argument doesn't mean anything. That it's like a play. That does not make it a bad movie just because it's in three spaces. Um, and talking about the makeup, it's an Oscar award winning for makeup. That Those kind of effects um, is really what brings people into thinking these movies are real. That makeup is better than anything you could have seen up until that point for the 80s. It, it, it seems more real than what you see now with the CGI, and that's why people want to return to physical makeup or um, physical effects. And this is the prime example of this, of when it's gone right. And it doesn't matter if this is his more mainstream, it's the best movie. Okay, it might not be the Cronenbergius, that could be Crash. Okay, we talk about going for his themes and going for the, the creepiness, that's Crash. And that it does not have the accessibility to make it his best movie in the beat classic. Okay, Fly does. All right, and with that, that'll bring the end to our final uh, main game argument of the fight. Once again, great job, guys. Um, that might have been the best one of the whole thing because I definitely had the most points jotted down on both sides. You guys did really well. De definitely, clearly, both Cronenberg fans. Hmm. Um, I literally finished the Fly 10 minutes before we got on camera for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen both of... movies. I've seen both movies probably a hundred times. Jesus. Um, <laughs> I have seen The Dead Zone. It was a long time ago, though, and I don't remember what you think. <laughs> well, okay, so just, just to talk about some of the points you guys hit on, um, you guys talk, you talked about, I believe it was Jeremy at the start, talked about the filmography he had leading up to The Dead Zone. Um, his filmography before that goes... Uh, Stereo, Crimes of the Future, Shivers, Rabbit, Fast Company, The Brood, Scanners, Videodrome. Uh, the Dead Zone was the same year as Videodrome, and then The Fly was actually the next one right after that. So they were very close together. Um, and then you also talked about the box office of the films and the success of the films. Uh, the Dead Zone cost $10 million, and it made 20.8 at the worldwide box office. Uh, the Fly cost somewhere in between 9 and $15 million. I couldn't find a confirmed number. Uh, however, it made way more, making sixty million dollars at the box office. Uh, more successful. Yeah, that um, can't dispute that one. But once again, uh, great fights from from both of you guys. Um, the thing is, and and maybe it is um, on the fact that you did admit that you haven't seen the Dead Zone in a long time. But the only hits you got against the Dead Zone were that it was forgettable and more generic than The Fly. Whereas Jeremy did get off some very good hits against your film. Uh, it doesn't deal with the same big themes. It, it's a smaller type of movie. Um, it's more reliant on effects, maybe necessarily, than story. And I will preface that I have not seen either of these films. So you're Oh, really? Oh, yeah. you got to see them. 
<laughs> I, I, the fly is one I've heard more about than Dead Zone. Yeah. Um, but you guys, you guys definitely sold me on both these films. They both sound like great movies. Um, but I, I think the points that Jeremy got off against the fly were more critical than the ones that Zach was able to get off against the Dead Zone. And again, maybe they, they both admitted Jeremy definitely seems to be the more Cronenberg fan than Zach is. But unfortunately, it is going to help him in this fight. He is going to get the point, and we're going to oh. lead round one to three. Arguing against one of my favorite movies. I, <laughs> that was crazy. I, I, will, I will preface this. If you, guys did not pick up on it, if you guys did not pick up on it from that little discussion, and Jeremy <laughs> did pick the fly first. Yeah. Um, and because of a messaging error, I didn't see it and accepted Zach's answer of the fly yeah. before his. And then when I told Jeremy, Jeremy's like, no, nah, I'll change it. So clearly he, he knew what he was talking about. Well, sometimes it's easier to argue against something you love because you know it so well. <laughs> I guess. That's, that's definitely that's a psychological thing. You can yeah. definitely pull that off. And it, and it worked. Okay. I, um, and I'm glad I like the fly because I actually, uh, I've seen a bit of Cronenberg more of the recent stuff and there's nothing I like. That's why I chose a movie I've never seen. No, <laughs> really? Well, like, you saw like Matt. So, what is, what is, so really, what do you think having just finished it? Oh, no, it's really great. It's really fun. Is it um, awesome? I mean, it is, All that movie. It is, I, I wish I could have waited a month and watched it near Halloween because it gives me exactly <laughs> that monster feel yeah. that I like in my Halloween. Um, I... I said it was just a monster movie. It was probably like the best monster movie ever. <laughs> All right, so with that, guys, we're going to go ahead and go into the speed round. So here's the deal. So the score is currently one to three. Like I said, Zach, you are not out of this fight whatsoever. Hmm. But in order to the win, in order to win you do have to uh, get all three of these. Now, here's, here's the thing with the uh, points. Because the way that we do the ranking in the system is based off a points total that I've figured out based on including winning the matches and individual performance. If Zach can pull out at least two of these, but Jeremy still ends up being the winner of the fight, he will still be one of the higher-ranked competitors out of the people who have lost matches, simply because he did technically win the speed round 2-1. to one. So you still have a chance to put yourself a little higher in the rankings, but it's going to be a challenge to come out with the win, but it is certainly possible. All right, so with that, we're going to go ahead and go into the first question, um, and this is a question that I've asked before in a match that I was actually the host of that I decided to re-ask because it, and it ended up turning into a different question. Um, so the two answers I'm blocking are Star Wars The Force Awakens and Star Wars Rogue One. Mm -hmm. The question is, best female-led action movie? Aliens? Um, Kill Bill. All right, that's what we're looking for. Uh, Jeremy <laughs> said alien first. Zach said kill Bill. Uh, are we doing one or two? Just for correct preference. Doing for what? Oh. Um, Just for I'll clarification. Say I'll say one. To kill Bill one. Okay. All right. So kill Bill volume one. So. Uh, the way you guys know, just so you guys know the way the speed round works, you guys are going to have 20 seconds on the initial argument. Jeremy is going to go first because he said aliens first, then Zach's going to go after Then after that, you guys are going to have 10 seconds here for your rebuttal. Uh, so, And just so you guys know, you guys do have a minute to think about it. If you want to think about what the person says, I will do not start the clock until you begin speaking. So Jeremy, you are first. You are arguing aliens when you start speaking. To me, Ripley in the movie Aliens, the second in the Alien franchise, is the ultimate uh, female action star. This is, this is a, a woman who reluctantly is put into a situation she does not want to be in, and she's the most competent person dealing with this horrific situation, dealing with these alien monsters, and in the, in the middle of being a badass and having to deal time. with... Save, oh, sorry. No, you're, no, you're fine. Goes. Thank you for stopping. <laughs> that goes fast. <laughs> it, it does when you get into it. 20 seconds sound yeah. longer in theory. All right, Zach, you're up next. 20 seconds on the clock when you start speaking. So Kill Bill Volume 1 has an action hero completing lots of very physical action. It is stylized, which makes it a lot of fun, but it's also really physical. You're seeing her arms get It's not guns. You're watching sword fighting, which is always much more exciting for me in an action film. And she is on vent. She has her motivation. She is a woman done wrong. Um, Time. With that... Okay. All right. Jeremy, when you're ready, 10 seconds on the clock to rebut. Okay. 
So Ripley is a true hero. Uh, she becomes a mother figure to a little girl named Newt. She basically saves Newt, saves all the other people, is a hero, does amazing things, uh, whereas Fine. Beatrice in Kill Bill isn't. All right, Zachary, 10 seconds on the clock when you start speaking. Okay, so you don't see um, Ripley be that hero until the end. For the beginning, you just see her whine a lot and fight and go, oh, no, you're going to get attacked. But you see Uma Thurman kicking ass for the whole movie. And that's your introduction Hi. to her and you understand that character. <laughs> I'm not too – I'm a fast speaker, but it takes me a while to get my thoughts. This is hard. No, no, yeah. I'm, I'm too blowhardy. I can't get it all out that fast. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, did both, both did that for the first time. Um, but I – I, I'm going to have to give it to Zach on that one because he talked more about the action aspect of the yes, answer, yes. and he was able to get the hit back that Ripley doesn't really become the hero until the end, whereas uh, his heroine does start out from the very beginning. I forgot her name. Uh, starts out right from the set. Uh, so with that, the, Zach gets the first point of the speed round. It's going to go two to three. And we're going to lead into the second question. So what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to give you guys two options. Um, that have some sort of relation to each other, and you guys are going to pick which one's the better one once I say them. All right, and the relation that these two have in honor of Stephen King being released this weekend, which of these two is the better Stephen King adaptation? The Shawshank Redemption or The Shining? The Shining. Okay, Shawshank. All right, so Jeremy, let me just make sure I have this down correctly. Jeremy has The Shining. And Zach, you have Shawshank. All right, and once again, it's going to be 20 seconds on the clock once you start speaking, Jeremy. Okay. The Shining, to me, is the ultimate horror film. It's psychological. It's otherworldly. It puts you into a mood and creates uh, horror like no other film ever. Shawshank Redemption is a good drama, but it's not singular in the way The Shining is. That movie lives in my soul. There's nothing else like it. All right, and he had three seconds to spare there, but that is time for him. Zach, 20 seconds on the clock when you start. Speaking of movies that live in soul, Shawshank speaks to people's soul. It is very important to people and powerful to people and inspires them to live their life in a certain way. It is not a genre piece. It is not a horror piece. It is able to extend and be more meaningful to anyone. And uh, – so this is what I think Stephen King does best is in movies. Is, um, and movies like Stand by Me and this. I'm not All right, Jeremy, ten seconds on the clock when you begin speaking to rebut. People are moved by Forrest Gump and other movies too, but the, Stanley Kubrick's a genius, a master filmmaker, and the mood and the environment that he creates in The Shining is completely standalone Fine. in cinema. All right, Zach, ten seconds when you begin speaking. Um, the elephant in the room is that Stephen King did not like The Shining. So to be a Stephen King adaptation, it's not. It's a Kubrick movie. An adaptation is Shawshank. It was able to still be cinematic, but still be really true to what King wanted in his book. That one was close. Um, playing that out in my head, Jeremy had a really great opening talking about the, the diversity that The Shining brings as a film and how even though it is a horror film, it hits all these different types of horror in one film. Uh, and then Zach brought it out with that it, it's it's not a ton of different things. The Shawshank is is one solid film. It knows what it wants to be. It it, it reaches out to people. Um, again, very close fight. You you guys are actually doing a really good job of the speed round. Um, it's a it's it'd be a shady technicality, but I'm gonna give it to him. The question is, what is the better Stephen King adaptation? <laughs> Yeah, I the, he does have that fair point on his side. When Stephen King doesn't like your adaptation, that is a hit against it. Um, unfortunately, he did bring it up at the end. So he didn't have time to hit back against it, but that that's going to make me give him the point. Zach is going to take this. I'm really good at finding the technicalities. <laughs> ah, I like to do that too. <laughs> and and that, and that's the thing is, as a general, as a 
and here's my thing. As a judge, sometimes that's what I'm looking for because I've had fights before where it's, you know, whether it's you have both competitors putting so much out there and making such great arguments or you have arguments where maybe it's a little bit of a weaker one and they're not putting as much out there. Sometimes it is that one point or that one technicality. It's that one thing that sticks out and breaks it. And, you know, even though it may seem like a cheap shot at times when you say it, that that's what, you know, we're looking for to decide that winner because you, you have to get that winner somehow. Um, but, but once again, great argument, guys. And that means we're going to get to the final question. And with this one, I am going to give uh, more time to argue. We're going to go up to 30 and 20. The score is 3-3, three, three, so the winner of this question will take the match. Um, but no matter who wins it, I just want to say you guys both did great this game. Uh, no matter who wins and loses, I think both of you guys are going to do really well in your second round matches. Here's the question, okay? So, uh, this week a story came out confirming that Shia LaBeouf is not returning for Indiana Jones 5, which I think we're all happy about that one. Um, but here's the question. Besides Indiana Jones himself, if you could pick only one character from any of the previous four Indiana Jones movies to return, which character would you pick and why? Henry Jones. Um, I'm not a huge Indiana Jones head. Can I... I'm going to say the actress. Can I get the name? Yeah, you know the actress? Okay, Catherine... Or, oh my gosh. Karen Allen? No, I'm, not Karen Allen. <laughs> um, she already came back. <laughs> Which one? Kate Blanchett from the one everyone hates from Crystal Skull. Kate Blanchett. Oh, okay. Oh, Kate Blanchett's villain character. And and just to, to clarify, Henry Jones is the father, right? Yes, Sean Connery, yes. Okay, good. Because I was going to say uh, both these characters technically die, but this is fake, so who cares? Uh, Irina Spalco is the character's name. Mm -hmm. I was called her Irina. <laughs> That's fine. I, yeah. And I, I won't hold that one against you. Um, all right. So we're going to have uh, Sean Connery versus Kate Blanchett, Henry Jones versus Irina Spalko. Um, I'm already forgetting if that's her correct name. I don't care. Um, then we went again. You had it out first. So you're going to go first. Uh, like I said, we're extending the time. So 30 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. Sean Connery's last movie was The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I hate that movie. I want Sean Connery to come back and go out on a high note. Henry Jones is one of the greatest characters he ever played. The, the rapport that he and Harrison had was amazing. It was a wonderful, uh, affecting story between the two of them, how they connect. I would love him to come back. I'd love to see that relationship one more time. I'd love us to say goodbye to both of these characters at the same time in a way that's emotional. It could be a flashback sequence or, or a flashback story, but I just I want to see it. I time. think it would be really powerful. All right, good argument. Zach, 30 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. Kate Bencha as Irina has great potential. Kate Bencha always has potential, and I love her as a villain. I want to see her as a villain. She was put into a bad movie. I want to see another chance given to a female villain that we don't see too often in the Indiana Jones franchise. Um, it, it has a different aspect. It's something new. Okay, see the... Okay, I'm saving my feet. <laughs> All right, so you're going to stop it there, cut it early? Yeah. All right. Uh, guys, Jeremy, you're going to go first off. Obviously, 20 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. Okay. Um, the, the villain in, in Crystal Skull, the Kate Blanchett character, is a one-note character. Um, she doesn't have any of the intensity that characters like Mola Ram and Belloc have. These were layered villains. Then, and this was, I don't even know what her motivation was, really. Henry Jones, this is something that I think every true Indiana Jones fan wants to see, is to Fine. see this character come back. All right, Zach, 20 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. Indiana Jones and his dad is something people want to see. It's something they saw. It already happened. We already had the emotional kick from it. We don't need to see it again. You said she was underdeveloped. That's why I want a new movie. I want to see her developed. I think she has a potential. I want to see her motivations because then you get the great actress, Kate Blanchett, creating another memorable character for us um, in a franchise that deserves a memorable female villain. Fine. And that's something we've already seen. All right. 
So, a uh, good good fight from both of you. Um, Zach, you really did bring it in it there at the end. Your first argument was a little shaky, but you did bring it back in at the end. Um, but I, I, I'm going to have to go with Jeremy on this one, and I, I think maybe familiarity with the films does help him a bit more once again, but he, he, talked more about the, he talked more about the relationship between the characters, and he talked about more how you could involve his character back into the film. Uh, whereas, unfortunately, while I think as an argument for bringing more female villains into franchises themselves and definitely giving Kate Blanchett another shot at being a villain, the argument was more generic and it, it, you could apply that to any franchise. It wasn't to the character itself in the Indiana Jones franchise, which is why I have to give the point to Jeremy. Um, but once again... Uh, just want to say, so that means that will bring the, the final score in this match to a 4-3. Uh, Jeremy will win the match, but again, uh, Zach, you didn't do that bad. You kept it up right till the end. You did technically win the speed round, so that'll help you within the rankings. Um, but both of you guys did really well today. Uh, first, we'll go to Zachary. Any thoughts about the match and where can people find you? Um, I mean, that was... So much fun. Uh, if you can tell, I'm a little nervous coming in on the camera. I don't have as, quite as much experience as Jeremy. That's why I forget my words sometimes. But I'm, I'm gaining the confidence, and I, I feel like I really earned my place, especially um, I liked getting the chance that Jeremy was my first match. It's like ripping off the Band-Aid. You're going against someone who is really great and talented. It's not anyone easy, and I felt like I hold my own, and that helps me um, feel confidence in going into this league in the future. And where people can find me? Um, I am active on many of the other leagues. I would try to be more active in the Movie Battleground League. I do compete in the, this current season of There Will Be Trivia and will be I substituting in for the um, World War movies as well, so you can see me competing there hopefully soon. All right, and Jeremy, go ahead. Back on the mic, where can people find you? I just want to say this was a lot of fun. Uh, I just... <laughs> This is great. I love what you guys do. And I just have to give all the credit in the world to Zach. You were incredible. I, I totally thought you had me beat a couple times. And I'm just so impressed with what you did, especially if you're saying you're feeling a little nervous on camera. I think you're going to kill it in, in future matches here. And uh, I, I just, this, this, this is great. I'm so happy to, to have played today and I hope to come back soon. Uh, you can find me on the Movie Trivia Schmodown Fan Reaction League. I'm one of the main admins there. Um, we post... Uh, we are reactions to every Schmodown match, and we're doing a lot of trial by fire special matches, which I write most of the questions for. And I also have my own YouTube channel at Jeremy Paul Adams. <laughs> I think we lost Aaron. I think we lost Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> that might, you might have to redo that. It might not be videotaped. No, no, no. I'm still here. Everything we're going to tell you about okay, that. Okay. <laughs> uh, and you guys. <laughs> All right, we're, we're, everything was recorded, though. You guys can find me uh, on Instagram at Aaron T. Canole. Obviously, if you guys are not a part of the Movie Battleground Facebook page, go and join there. That's where you guys will get on the list to get a match of, uh, down the road. Uh, that's where you guys will also see... Uh, you guys can get the direct links to the matches through there. But um, as well as joining the page, subscribe to the channel. Um, and just check out all the previous matches. Stick around for all the matches in the future. And guys, Jeremy, Zach, thank you for this fight. And I will see you guys next time on the Movie Battleground. Have a nice night. Take care.